Welcome to another live stream edition of Cafe Day. Renee, James here, joins again wider once. Ugh, can't talk tonight, and I haven't been drinking. Joined once again by the star of the show, Mr. Renee Dupree. Oh, Renee, how you doing? I'm doing fine. We're awaiting our guest this evening, Mr. Devon Dudley. He's running late, but that's okay. That has not stopped us in the past and will not stop us going further. In the meantime, let's talk wrestling. Wrestling. Yeah. Um, I guess we'll start off. Uh, so the big show for New Japan this past couple of days, uh, Wrestle Kingdom. Um, not a bad show. I'll be honest, I haven't watched the whole show just yet, but I will get to it. Um, I suppose a couple of the main talking points. The one was the appearance of um, Dolph Ziggler, or as he's now known as, uh, Nick Nemeth. He was at ringside with his brother, um, is he Ryan Nemeth, his brother? Yeah. And um, basically confronted uh, David Finley at ringside, and they had a bit of a brawl back and forth, uh, went to backstage, and yeah, it looks like Dolph Ziggler and Nick Nemeth will be, I don't know if he's signing for New Japan, but it looks like that's his first destination there. Thoughts on that, Renee? Well, New Japan, well, Japanese wrestling is a total different style. So this is going to be able, it's going to be interesting to see if um, Nemeth can hang with those guys, right? Because he's been doing, I don't think he ever worked outside of WWE. Like he, he was never an independent wrestler, I don't think. No, he, he, he was an amateur wrestler in high school and college. Um, but fuck like he's been in the WWE developmental and like must be since 2005 2006 well mm -hmm. he was on main roster in 2006 so possibly yeah. earlier yeah so his whole career has been WWE uh the fact that he did amateur <clears throat> might help him in Japan because all those yeah. guys are shooters right mm -hmm. so um it's gonna be interesting um what else do we have we had riddle pop up yeah uh he didn't pop up at the show but he uh there was a vignette uh he still had the sandals um <laughs> the flip-flops he was uh punching and kicking a uh, heavy uh, uh, boxing bag and yeah basically laid out the challenge for to tanahashi for new, i think it's new year's bash um so that one's a bit of a surprise but as we've spoken about riddle he likes extra substances using and japan's really strict on it so do you think this is going to work out for him <laughs> yeah if i were him i'd leave uh i'd leave that stuff at home and go yeah. over there. um christ man sidel got busted with like a weed pen he did like three months in japanese prison um, yeah I mean, I mean i you won't know but i would imagine you've heard stories what's the prisons like in japan compared to north america or even europe um it's like a little box right a little tiny little box like you can spread out your arms and touch each wall basically wow. yeah and, uh, very strict i mean japanese culture is very strict as is so i can just yeah. If you're in prison, how strict it is, right? Not a place I'd want to be. No, no. Uh, we can always uh, we can always call up Michael Og and ask him. He spent some time in there. <laughs> uh, this man, Jeff, is MJF out with an injury? Um, yeah. Sorry, Dave, on just message me. Um, he's coming on now. Um, yeah. So, um. Apparently, he's been injured for a little bit. He's been wrestling non-stop. Thank you, Martin, for the super chat. Um, he's been non-stop. He's been a trooper. But, yeah, apparently, some major issues with his shoulder. I think he's, he's hoping to 26. avoid... Yeah, 26, 27. Yeah, shoulder issues already. Uh, that's not yeah. good. Um, not good. Apparently, he's um, hoping to have it healed. Uh, he's waiting for it to heal rather than have surgery. I think he's trying to avoid having surgery, but he might have no choice but to have surgery. But well, maybe yeah. he should do top rope elbows uh, from the top to the outside on the fucking ground. Maybe that we should start with that, buddy. Yeah. yeah. 
So, um, yeah, that's um, that. Uh, speaking on MJF, uh, Road Dog came out recently and um, he, he put over MJF, but he basically at the end he said, you know, with all that said, I am a better sports entertainer for him. Um, I mean, he's not. Uh, MGF is entertaining, but I think people kind of forget how over the New Age outla Outlaws were because they were super over. And Road Dog likes to put himself over, doesn't he? Jesus Christ, we're talking about marks for themselves. Well, I mean, I he even said he, I never he, met said same, he said the same thing about Brett. He said, so I'm a better sports entertainer than Brett. As well, so uh, he has said it a few times. Sports entertainer, as far as in, yeah, I guess he'd be right there because Brett was never known for his fucking promos. No, right? I mean, I don't know. I whatever, dude. Where's Devon? He's just gonna show up or what? Yeah, I've just sent him the link, uh, so he should be on real soon. All right. Um. Yeah, I don't know, dude. Listen. It was a different time, 90s. Everybody everybody was over in the 90s. Fuck. What an awesome time that was. Now wrestling's hot. You can't say it's not hot now because guys are making more money than ever, right? But let's face it. If Tony Khan wasn't around, there'd only be like one game in town. And when there's only one game in town... Vince or whoever's in charge pays the guys whatever they want to pay you. Like when I was there. Yeah. And they they would constantly remind you that there was no other way to go, nowhere place to go and threaten to fire you. And so you're constantly walking on eggshells. It was a terrible time when I was there. Terrible, terrible. Yeah. Uh, it's just uh, working out how to get on now. So, um, I've just sent him the link through email as well, so I'll just tell him to uh, try that one. So, yeah, bear with us, everyone. Um, what was going to say? Um, shoot, I've got something in mind now. Um, yeah, um, yeah, we done the uh, WrestleMania the other night, and um, there's the famous entrance during the uh, you know the invasion angle between WCW and WWE mm. when Stone Cold came out, and I said to you, I'm like. I don't think we'll ever get to see anyone ever get that over. And I think it's impossible for someone to get that over again, especially in today's day and age, because like, don't run KFA was kind of dead by the attitude era, but there was still, some people still believed it. I did myself, but now it's just completely gone. I just don't think anyone could, there's no one believable to get that over anymore. Well, the rock is pretty over, isn't he? Yeah. Well, speaking of a guy who is over, uh, Renee, do you want to introduce our special guest? Well, he's a man that I've wrestled with all over the world, in many different countries, many different continents. Uh, I hadn't before last month. I hadn't seen him in about fifteen or sixteen years, but here he is tonight on the cafe, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Devon Dudley. Hey, man, how you guys doing? Devon, what's going on, Renee? Hey, buddy. Glad you can make it, man. How you feeling? Oh, well, I'm dealing with some sinus problems. I, You know, I live in Florida, so usually it doesn't happen until spring. But right. for some reason, January and February is like Florida's winter. We have like 50-degree weather. It even dropped down to 27 degrees. And yet my sinuses have been on fire. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. Yeah. Sorry. It's driving me crazy, but other than that, that's what this. Oh, you froze oh. there. Shit. It wouldn't be an addition of the cafe without technical difficulties, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Are you there? Okay. So speaking of where you used to live, that's where you started your 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 uh your career, right? If I'm not mistaken, you started with Johnny Rods in Brooklyn. In New York. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, born and raised. Um, and I found out about Johnny Rod's school uh, through a wrestling uh, talk show in New York, which was 66, um, 66 something, the fan with Jody Mack and Rich Mancuso. And they did a wrestling 
It's like a, but it was a talk show. It was a radio show. I called in and asked where I would become a professional wrestler, and I was only a, I was only in tenth grade. The guy says, "Yeah, it's like after the show, I'll call you back and I'll let you know, you know, where to go." So I talked to him. It was like the week of WrestleMania four. So oh. he was at the Trump Plaza, and I'm I'm being a mark. I'm asking him all sorts of questions. Hey, how's Ricky the Dragon Steamboat? How's the Magnificent Morocco? Is Hogan there? The Macho Man? I mean, I'm being a complete mark for this guy, and I think. Finally realized that I was some young punk kid, and he goes, "Well, I'll be at Johnny Rogers School on Monday, and if you want to meet me down there, you know, meet me down there." So I went, "Okay." I never showed up. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. I, I mean, again, I was a junior um, hmm. high school, and um, I'm not even junior. I was a sophomore. My parents weren't going to let me go, <laughs> right. and no way, you know. So, but I, when I graduated from high school, I remembered what he said. I called Gleason's gym. Johnny Rods was still there. And the rest is history. So, like, how did it work back then? You just, did you pay your money up front, the whole tuition, and then you started? Or did you pay monthly? Or how did it work? Monthly, it was like quarterly in a sense. Um, I put down a lump sum payment and then started paying him, you know, after that. Um, I know some schools nowadays, they do want, you know, you have to pay all up front. But Johnny was cool, you know. I never came up with, I think it was $3,500. Wow. Then in 91, that was a lot of money. A lot of money, yeah. And for an 18 year old kid, I'm like, how the hell am I going to get that? <laughs> right, right. So and, you just worked part time jobs and just hustled? I, that's, I mean, that's exactly what I did. And my grandfather gave me the majority of the bulk of the money wow. and promised him I'd pay him back and everything. And I, and I paid him back every dime. Damn. Um, you know, it was one of those things where he never had to come looking for me. You know, when family members borrow money and all of a sudden they don't have it. Now, all of a sudden, you got to go looking for them. But they needed the money. You, they, they, they'd call you at a drop of a dime. They didn't care. Right, you know, right, right, call, right. Me tomorrow, call me tomorrow at 6 p.m. Brother, they would call you at 5.58 p.m. <laughs> if they didn't have the money, you couldn't find them anywhere. Right. I think Vince actually said that. He's, he's quoted saying, You can't trust family. I'm like, holy <laughs> crap. Yeah. Grandfather trust me at that time. Hold on. I'm going to put my AirPods in. <laughs> yeah, brother. That better testing, testing. Yeah, right. There we go. There we oh. go. Yeah. So my grandfather was able to trust me, and I made sure of it. When I was late with a payment, I would call him and tell him. Right. You know, I would say, You know, hey, grandfather, I don't have the money right now. I'm a little short. Can I give it to you next week? And he, his, my name for him was Varney. He called me Varney. He's like, Varney, don't worry about it. You know, you you text, you um, you, you send it to me next week. So I gave him double the, the following week. Uh, I always made good on it. You know, never did. And I remember towards the end of my career, uh, right before he passed away, we talked about it. And I said, Grandfather, I said, I paid you every dime. I, you never had to come looking for me. And he goes, you're right. I don't. I didn't. He goes, Varney, you were good. He also called me Pretty Boy. <laughs> yeah, that was his nickname. He called me Pretty Boy. He's like, Pretty Boy, I never had to come looking for you. I said, that's right, Grandfather. You never had to come looking for me. I still felt like that little kid that used to be on his lap and he used to bounce me around and have the quarters in his pocket and jingling them around. So when you asked for a piece of candy at a store, he would go in his pocket with that, with all those quarters and pull you out of the corner. You thought, thought he was rich. <laughs> right. You know? So that's the way he was. The Gleason's Gym, Johnny Rods. There was a bunch of guys, Taz, Tommy, yep. Trier, how many yep, guys that were like was, East, you guys? Well, it was Taz, Tommy Dreamer, myself, Big Dick Dudley, yeah, uh, Big Sal, yeah, uh, Angel, Angel Medina, he was in there as well. Yeah. Uh, he came after Big Vito, uh, okay. was another one. So Johnny produced a lot of people a lot. that came yeah. out of his school, uh, Mondo Clean who a lot of people may not know, but Mondo Clean was one of the first guys on Monday Night Raw at the Manhattan Center. Uh, he was he was like in between enhancement talent and talent that they really used to push. And Mondo was a unique character. He was he looked he his he was like a psychotic. Uh, how do I say this? He was like um, a psychotic barbarian in a sense, and he played every part of that. And I think a part of that was him. 
but he was he was like probably the real first wrestler that I had ever encountered that was actually out of his mind. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of those. Oh God, he was the first one and scared me to death, man. Scared because right. he was a big guy too, you know, all jacked up. Yeah. And the way he walked around, it was like, uh, you know, I mean, he did that even when he wasn't in the ring. He scared the hell out of me. I remember we were at Gleason's um, at practice and we were, you know, going over. They were teaching us moves and everything. So Mondo shows up. He gets in his whole full gear and everything that he would wear on TV. He gets in the ring. I'm in the ring. He gets in the ring. I tag right out. <laughs> <laughs> what's this? He said, said Devon, where you going? I said, I gotta go to the bathroom, man. I'll be right back. <laughs> that was the longest piss I had ever taken. <laughs> I mean, I you know, I was an 18 year old kid and you know, I was barely 200 pounds and this guy was like 250 jack. Right. I mean, and just looked every bit of a psycho. <laughs> So okay, so what year what year did you finish your training at Gleason's gym? I was there from ninety one to ninety six. Oh, so you stayed there, okay. But so yeah. you started with ECW, you were still training at Gleason's gym? I was still training a little bit at Gleason's gym, so I kind of went back and forth. Johnny made me kind of feel bad. He was like, oh, I know what's gonna happen. You know, I gave the phone call and those guys are gonna take you and you're never gonna show back up here again and blah blah blah. I was like, No, Johnny, I'll be back. I was like, trust me, I ain't leaving Gleason. So I kind of felt guilty. And I stayed for about at least another six months okay. and uh, trained at Gleason's and I would still come back. But then there were some people that were there that was giving me shit. Uh, they were a little jealous because I had gotten uh, the phone call to go. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. And that kind of hurt my feelings because, you know, I, I broke into the business with these guys and I was, I thought we were like real friends. Yeah. You know? And for them to take it that way hurt my feelings a lot. So I had stopped going uh, because I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to cause any beef or any riff right. and not, um, you know, have a, I didn't want to have arguments with these guys or anything. So I just left. I mean, I still, I still spoke to Johnny, but I just stopped going and used the thing, you know, I was on the road a lot and, you know, I would love to come by, Johnny, but I just can't because I just didn't want to start any problems. Right. Well, you bring up a good point, like jealousy and wrestling. I mean, it's so fucking prevalent, right? I mean. Listen, I've, I've seen a lot of it right. in my career. Hell, I've even seen it now that I'm done. Right. Um, you know, and, you know, different organizations that I've gone to, you know, it's like, you know, I'll, I'll show up at certain places and. You know, it's like, oh, why is Devon here? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, bitch, relax. I ain't taking nobody's job. I'm just coming here to visit. Relax. <laughs> God damn, what is your problem? <laughs> Fucking relax. Yeah. Right. Well, but you know, I mean, that's the way you know society is, and that's the way the generation of wrestlers are now. Right. They're, they're very paranoid. I mean, it was you heard those stories back in the Hogan and Andre era, but it's even more prevalent now that these guys are really? a lot of them are jealous and. A lot of them are jealous and they are paranoid, you know, well, and I mean, it's not every, it's not everybody. Don't get me wrong. It's not everybody. It's a select a few. It's right. the ones that did not break into the business correctly. Mm. Well, I mean, Christ, when we were in WWE together, I mean, you remember the meetings we had with Johnny Ace where he'd be like, Hey guys, where are you going to go work? There's nowhere else to go work. <laughs> so, I mean, they kind of instill that paranoia in us at that point. At least I, that's the way I felt, you know, being a yeah. small opinion boy, you know. And, you know, and the thing about it was when I know when me and Bubba were there, by the time you guys got there, hmm. I don't know. I had this feeling like I was like, I thought it was going to last forever. Right. I never thought, I never thought it was going to end, you know, the money, yeah. being on TV. Uh, being picked for certain spots that they knew that you could carry. I just always thought it was going to last forever. And even yeah. though we were told growing up in the business, kid, this ain't going to last forever, so enjoy it while it lasts. Yeah. I was one of those kids that took it for granted and um, thought it would last forever. Right. You know, so now, you know, here it is so many years later, I'm sitting back and I'm just like, damn, it's over. <laughs> you you know? know, think about it, man. 
when we were working together, it's been 21 years. Yeah. I mean, it went by quick, man. I mean, I've been a total in this business. I'm like, what, 30, 33, 34 years. And it just seemed like yesterday I rolled down to Johnny Ross's school with my money saying, here you go. Right. <laughs> Can but you train I, me? Christ, we had so many big time, and at least for me, in my career, I mean, the time La Resistance versus the Dudley Boys in Sydney, yeah. Australia, I, it was either 30,000 <laughs> or 40,000. Yeah. So, Stadium, you know, and we're like, I mean, and that, and that's the, the thing. That's the but, thing, too. You, you, we did those shows, and you know, 30,000, it was almost like we expected it to be 30 or 40,000 people there. Never once did we ever think that the attendance would be down or anything like that, right. or that we would never be in this spot forever. At least that's the way I thought. Mm -hmm. You know, again, do I reminisce like some of the old timers did back when I was a young boy in the business? Yeah. I reminisce a lot because it was so good. Everybody was making money and everybody was over. Yeah. And every and all the fans knew the stories. Mm -hmm. There was not one story that was being told on WWF TV uh, that nobody didn't know. And everybody knew everybody's story. It was a, it was just a really, really good time. I know it was a great time for a lot of the fans because they still talk about it. Yeah. And they still reminisce and I get it all the time. You know, Devon, you were my childhood. I'm like, if one of y'all motherfuckers come up to me and say one more time that I was your child, <laughs> I'm gonna knock the hell. I was like, I feel old as shit already. Stop saying that. <laughs> no, but it feels good though. It, it feels good because uh, you know, uh, the lives that we touched yeah. during that time yeah. is insane and incredible. I mean, I remember again, I you know. A young kid grew up in the projects in Brooklyn, New York. It was very rough in the area that I was living in, Flatbush and Nostrand Avenue. At the time, uh, in the late in the late 70s, uh, all through the 80s, it was rough. And I remember a lot of my friends were either getting killed or going to jail or they were selling drugs. Meanwhile, I was rushing home to see what Piper and Hogan were going to do on right. TV. You know, I didn't care to be um you know in the streets following that type of lifestyle my thing was was randy savage gonna take that bell and come off the top rope onto ricky the dragon steamboat's throat and how was steamboat gonna come back you know from that uh was tito santana ever gonna get his belt from the macho man after what happened in the boston garden i mean it was one of those things where i couldn't wait to get home school was over i ran home i didn't hang out with the guys and nothing i ran home to try to find you know wwf on tv right and going through my old magazines and everything that was my love wrestling saved me so Please. when people tell when people tell me you know i was their childhood i think back and reminisce how i grew up yeah. because when i when i met the hogan and andre era it was incredible yeah, yeah. Uh, i remember one, I remember you saying in the locker room, like you went out and said, I was a Hogan guy, man. I loved Hogan. You were a Hogan guy your whole life, right? Yeah, I was a Hogan guy my whole life. Yeah, I mean, it was it was incredible. You know, a lot of people know Hulk Hogan now, you know, mm -hmm. and this generation know Hogan when he came back uh, to WWE the second time. Yeah. Uh, when, he had that, when he had that run with The Rock and the NWO and all that. But if you weren't born in the 80s, if you weren't born in the 70s leading up into the 80s, then you just don't really know the feeling that Hulkamania yeah. gave during that time. It was an incredible time. Wrestling was just so hot. It was like, would we ever see that again? It was just incredible. The feeling, Hogan was everywhere. He was like, I mean, look, people might not have known who the president was or the vice president, but they sure as hell knew who Hulk Hogan was. I mean, that, that's how big it was, you know, okay. and people, you can't really digest that unless you were born during that era and you felt the things that we felt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, see, I was in high school when the Attitude Era was at its peak, right? So I remember when WWF came to town the next day at school, literally every guy had a, either a DX or an Austin <laughs> yeah. Every guy, every guy. A few girls, but all the guys had those T-shirts. It's like, you know, then like now it's, I don't know. Would you say that wrestling is kind of booming in a, 
nothing compared to like the 80s or the attitude era but it's kind of like in a boom right now because i mean wf yeah. business is amazing right i mean it's amazing but it's weird because you would think that it's such on a high scale right now uh, you know, I'm hearing reports that they made more money now than they did back in the Attitude Era. Right. And I, you know, I'm not going to say I don't believe it or it's hard to believe, but I mean, the numbers that we did back then, we were sold out every single night, every right. live event. The tickets were so hot. Yeah. Every Monday Night Raw, every SmackDown yeah. was just on fire. Um you know, I remember, you know, being a producer, you know, when I was in WWE, a lot of the live events were not sold out and we had great talent. You know, the talent that you see now uh, that's on WWE TV, we they were great talent. Yeah. You know, they were then and then, you know, but yet the building wasn't sold out the way it should be. Now, you go back to the Attitude Era and every single night, because listen, from the main event, with Austin and The Rock, yeah. If they were wrestling, to you know the opening match, Funaki, Little Guido, they got huge pops, yeah. huge reactions. I remember the show had begun, and I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't know it had begun. I just, I heard the people screaming out of their seats. I was like, "What the hell is going on?" I said, "It must be The Rock or Austin out there." And they said, no, it's Little Guido and Funaki. I was like, holy shit. I mean, right. that's not that's not saying anything bad about Funaki and 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 uh, yeah. Guido because they were excellent. I loved working with those guys. I had yeah. some of my greatest matches with Funaki. Yeah. I mean, it was phenomenal. But, you know, because of where they were on the card, you would have thought The Rock came out. Those fans lost their mind. That just shows you how over everybody was. Yeah. During that time. Yeah, man. I remember, yeah, the first house show that I went to ever was 97. And it, the opening match, I still remember, it was Brian Christopher versus uh, um, Japanese guy. Um, okay. Taka Michinoku. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fucking hell, dude. Taka, I remember he did this spot. He ran from one corner. You know how Sabu would do the triple jump moonsault? Yes. Well, Bataka fucked the chair. He would just jump right to the top rope, do a huge dive, and all the. Yeah. I still remember. Yeah. It was a fucking <laughs> yeah. house show opening match from 30 years ago almost. I still remember it, right? Yeah, but I mean, it, it was just an incredible time, man. Incredible time. Um, so let's go back to ECW. How did you and Bubba meet? How did you and Bubba <laughs> team up? How? Tell me. I never knew. Well, Johnny Rods made the phone call to Taz because he had trained Taz. Right. I walked in. I had some personal problems um, at the time. My sons, Terrence and Terrell, yes. I was married. I was married to their mom at the time, and we were going through some little bit of uh, some times. Yeah. And I had left wrestling. I said I quit. I'm not coming back. I'm over. It's over. And uh, I'm. I was at the time. I was working in the post office, and I was like, I'm going to make this my job. You know. This is it. I'm gonna be a disgruntled postal worker. The whole nine. I mean, I was I was gonna do it. And then one day, you know, me me and their mom, you know, worked things out and I was holding my sons. I said, you know what, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna make something of myself, make you proud of me. As I was holding the, the twins in my arms. And I went back and just started freaking tearing it up at the school. Johnny called Taz and said, I got this guy named we call him A Train. And he'll blow everybody up there at, at, at your dojo and this and that. So when I come into the school, he tells me that he spoke to Taz and he told me that he told him, he goes, yeah, I told Taz that you blow everybody up there. I said, why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, you do realize that these guys use barbed wire bats and thumbtacks. I don't wrestle like that. Why would you tell this man that? Mm. Oh, don't worry, Devon. It's okay. Don't worry. I was like, no, it's not okay. I was like, these guys are going to kill me, you know? But um, I went down to the dojo. Um, I had to try out with Perry Saturn. And, oh. everybody, and everybody knows Perry Saturn. You can't blow him up. He was right. a machine. Right. And I know one day I'm going to, I'm going to, Perry's going to see me and go, God damn it, stop telling that story. <laughs> I walk in there. I mean, I was in great shape. And I just remember Taz was watching along with Tommy Dreamer on the outside and Bubba was sitting in the corner, uh, was as humble as humble can be. 
didn't say a word, did nothing. And I remember Taz gave me a few things to do in the ring, and I'm just going, 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 boom, boom, boom. Next thing you know, we're done. I'm bouncing around. Perry's on one knee, and Taz goes, so what do you think? And Perry goes, yeah, the kid's got it. He's got it. <laughs> <laughs> and Taz goes, you want to see anything else? Yeah, whatever you guys want to do, let me know. I said, I'll do anything you want me to do. And Perry goes, no, we good, we good. No, we're not doing anything else. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, I fucking blew up Perry Sad. And I was like, damn, this is good. Because Perry you know? Perry started originally with Kowalski, right? Yes, he started with Kowalski. And remember, uh, Perry was a uh, Green Beret Special Forces. Right, right. And so he was a legit badass. Right. So... I don't know. I think I might have caught Perry on a bad day. Maybe he ate some guacamole that didn't agree with him. Because <laughs> I still, to this day, I'm like, there's no way I, I blew this man up like that. There's no way. And apparently, and Taz was like, no, you did. I was like, wow, because me and Taz talked about it when he became an announcer in TNA. And I would always bring up the story. Because you know how sometimes you think in your head what you did, but in actuality, somebody else saw it differently. So I had to make sure, I had to ask Taz to make sure that what I was seeing was right. And both Bubba and Taz said, no, yeah, that you did that. <laughs> you did. And I remember after everything was over, Bubba didn't, you know, his real name, of course, is Mark Monaco. Yeah. So I get out of the ring, and I see him in the corner. I saw him when I first came into Dojo, but we never spoke. And um, finally, he comes over, he goes, how you doing? Bubba Ray Dudley, nice to meet you. And I went. Motherfucker, that ain't your real name. What is your name? Right. <laughs> and, you know, but, and that's how it all got started. Taz pulled me aside. He was like, we're looking for an African-American Dudley to come in. More like a Rastafarian. Can you grow dreads? I go, well, I'm letting you know right now. On top of my head, it's a little thin. So <laughs> I said, I don't know about dreads, but I can try to grow a flat top again. I don't think that's going to work, but I can try. It was like, oh, well, we may not have to draw, we may not have to worry about the dreads. Don't worry about it. I had the meeting with um, Paul Heyman at the ECW studio, yeah. and you know, Paulie was filling me out. He was, you know, whatever. And then all of a sudden, he he asked me. He go, I go, what are you going to call me? He goes, well, what are you using now? I go, well, I go by the name of A Train on the Independence. And he goes, ah, he goes, what's your, what's, uh, how about your name? I go, my name. He goes, yeah, your name. I go. Devon, he goes, Devon. We'll say Devon. We won't say Devon. We'll say Devon. Devon Dudley. And I went, eh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, eh, okay, Devon Dudley it is. Yeah. And I said, well, what do you think my character is going to be? He goes, let me ask you a question. What's your favorite movie? I said, favorite movie? He goes, yeah, what's your favorite movie? I said, Rocky, Rocky Three. He goes, let me guess, Sylvester Stallone? I said, no, Mr. T. And he said, um, oh, okay. He said, um, what do you know about Mr. T? I said, I love Mr. T. I said, not only that, I said, but I, you know, I used to, as a kid, I used to do him all the time. And he goes, really? He goes, give me a little bit of Mr. T. So the scene when Rocky was going to retire and the statue, and Mr. T came out, hey, woman, hey, I did that for Paulie. Paulie goes, oh, my God, you sound just like him. I go, I've been doing it for years. He goes, I love it. He goes. Let me ask you a question. He goes, who else do you like? I said, I'm a huge Mike Tyson fan. And he goes, okay. He said, uh, have you ever seen a movie Pulp Fiction? Because I told him about my parents. I told him about my parents um, being preachers and stuff like that. He said, you ever seen a movie Pulp Fiction? I said, yeah. I said, no, I'm sorry, I didn't. And he goes, um, okay. He was like, I want you to go to your local video store. Blockbuster. This is how old this is. Right. I want you to go to your, your 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 video store, your family video store, and I want you to rent the movie Pulp Fiction. It just came out on video. It left the theaters. I want you to go take a look at it, and I want you to see a character in the very beginning of the movie. His name is Jules. I want you to see if you can do that character. I went home, saw it, watched it a couple of times. I was like, oh, this is a cinch. Because again, the Reverend character, um, that drew somewhat gangster played was so new was very dear to me because of my parents 
Right. You know, I can scope, I can quote scriptures and all that. Listen, I was in Sunday school. I was in morning school. I was in a regular, I mean, I, I went to church on Sundays probably five or six times uh, a, a day on, on a Sunday, not to mention the revival. I mean, when you're the preacher's kid, you got no other choice. Right. You got to be living in there. Right. And um, I came back and I did the whole path of the righteous man. And I did it for Paul. And he goes, that's it. He goes, I want you to be Mr. T and Samuel L. Jackson all in one. And he was like, I was like, what about Mike Tyson? He goes, can you grow your hair a little bit taller? I was like, yeah, I can. And I was like, but the middle's a little whatever. I said, but I can do it. He was like, all right, do that. And then at the time when Mike Tyson was at his peak, he had like a part yes. going in the middle of his hair. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember when I had hair, I had the part going from here and I went all the way down okay. to the back. So that was kind of a tribute to Mike Tyson. Tyson. And uh, Devon Dudley was formed. Shit. So, okay. So now let's fast forward to when you went singles, right? You were like the, the preacher Devon when you had mm -hmm. your, your deacon. Devon. So that's like a playoff in real life because your parents, right? Yeah, it was a playoff in the real life. And the thing about that was, you know, I loved that character because it was me. Right. And when I had a brother love uh, doing it, it worked great. And this is nothing against Paul Heyman. I don't know if there was some beef between him and Heyman or not, but it was like I came in after doing about four or five skits with brother love producing me and Vince uh promos i mean because we would hit it in one shot we would do it in one shot everything was good it was never an issue vince loved it it was to the point where i would go to vince and go vince i go i had this idea i want to do uh for the backstage uh promo shot he goes i don't want to hear it he goes just, i want he goes just do it he was like wow. i'm gonna play off for you so a lot of that interaction with vince we played off of each other wow. and i remember bruce pritchett telling me you're hitting it right on the money, kid. You're doing great. I was like, okay, great. And the next thing you know, the next week I'm in California, uh, I think Sacramento somewhere. And I get told, I go to Bruce. I go, hey, Bruce. I go, um, you know, what's going on? What are we doing today? He goes, don't talk. He goes, I don't know. He goes, I don't, I don't work. I don't work with you anymore. I said, well, I said, what do you mean you don't work with me anymore? I said, what's going on? He goes, don't talk to me. Talk to your boss. I go, Vince, he goes, no, your former boss. I go, my oh. former boss, I go, what are you talking about? I go, Heyman? Because at the time he was writing for SmackDown. Right, right. And I went, okay. I was like, why am I talking to Paulie when you've been doing this for the past month? He goes, Devon, got to talk to him. My hands are, I'm done. And I said, I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, stop. I said, what do you mean you're done? I said, no, no, no. I said, no, it's got to be a mistake. Please tell me you're messing with me. He goes, no, I'm not messing with you. Paul Heyman is doing everything for you now. And I went, what the hell just happened? Wow. And I just remember, um, you know, talking to Paul. And, you know, I love Paul to death. But Paul, I don't think he understood a black preacher right. and, and how a black preacher works. We don't, black preachers don't use words that you can't pronounce let alone spell okay and that was the thing paul's vocabulary paul's intelligence was so high yeah. as we all know and he was writing promos for me that words i couldn't even pronounce let alone spell and right. i'm just like dude i was like this is not going to work for me right. you know and that was where it started to go downhill uh yeah and it went down quick and i even told paul i said paul i said i can't do this sure you can sure you can don't worry about it just do it i was like we need to redo these promos man we really do i said because i can't do this stuff okay. and it just went downhill from there you right. know um and you know again i love paul Heyman. i love him to death but i just felt that because brother love uh bruce pritchett did the brother love gimmick i thought that he should have been the one that should have been uh continuing with the reverend devon um so, and there was nothing and there was nothing against paul i'm, I'm right. gonna cut you up but it was nothing against paul it was just that i had already started with bruce yeah. so it should have finished with bruce right so in your opinion if you would have been able to still work with bruce you would have really been gotten that gimmick over more than yeah 
I mean, I can say yes and I can say no. I, I mean, because I don't really know. I mean, right. all I know is it was working really good when Bruce Pritchard and I and Vince were working together. And then, you know, like I said, somewhere along the line, it went south um, when Paul, I don't know if there was some beef between Paul and Bruce or whoever the powers to be, but it, all I know is when I came in to work that day, I w- it wasn't, it, w- it didn't seem positive. It okay. just seemed, and you know, Bruce was just like, oh, well, you don't, I don't do your stuff no more. I'm like, okay, can you please stop? Because I'm already nervous about doing a singles career. Now you're telling me that they took you off of it and they put Paul on. And I was nervous, a little nervous because Paul had just got the booking for, um, for SmackDown. And I was worried I was gonna get lost in the shuffle with everything that he was doing for the product. Um, so at the time, like, wait, like, you know how it is when one booker changes and the other booker comes in, he tries to like kill off what the other booker was working on. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, right. ideas, so you might've been a victim of that. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know if, I don't think Paulie would intentionally try to kill me off or anything like that. Like I said, the verbiage that was being used, I didn't particularly care for it. I wanted to do it in my own words. Yeah. And I remember going to tell Vince that. I had a talk with Vince and he was like, well, you need to get that character over this and that. And I kept trying to tell him, I said, I understand that Vince. I was like, but let me do the promos the way I want to do the promos. Yeah. You know, just like you did when we first started. There was never an issue when we first started. Now there seems to be an issue. I was like, you know, I I rather do it the way I see, you know, black preachers do it. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, and you know, no, no, no disrespect to Haman, you know, but he's a Jewish guy trying to tell a black man how to be a black preacher. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. I mean, he's a he's a genius. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, he could take chicken shit and make it into, you know, freaking, uh, you know, the greatest meal okay. you've ever had. Yeah. But again, you know, for a Jewish man to tell a black man how to be a black preacher, especially when I grew up in the black church, right. uh, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> so ultimately, how long did both you and Bubba stay singles? About a year? Uh, six months? I know, it was six months. Six months. Because yeah. then, uh, you know, I remember going to Vince about four months in, three to four months in. I said, if you just give me the opportunity to do this character the way I want to do it, it'll get over. But he never did. He never let me do it. And then he, um, you know, because once you, you and I both know, once you're in deep shit with Vince, you're in, you're you're done. Regardless of how you try to scoop yourself out of that, you're just done because he's only going to see what he had a negative vibe on you on, and that's it. He's never going to go back. And uh, that was one of the things that always bothered me about that because he, I never got that chance to go back and to redo it. And he put me with Farouk. I remember him, yeah. Farouk and I was uh, tagging at the time and that was great. I loved that. Yeah. I, really, I had a blast with Ron. Oh God, I had a blast with Ron. Um, you know, I, I, he could be funny. I, I, something tells me, like on house shows, he'd be funny to work with, like crack a joke and shit. Funny was it? Understand? Like we were in there with enhancement talent, right? And you know, I'm trying to be nice with him, take care of him. He he leaned over. He goes, "Divo, knock the shit out of that boy. <laughs> sit there and play with him. You knock the hell out of him." <laughs> I looked at the guy. I said, "Sorry, Ron." I said, "Beat your ass. I gotta beat your ass." <laughs> I said, "Sorry." Oh God, it was great. It was so good. Okay, so during this whole time, now mind you, when the whole time that I was in New York, I was never watching YouTube, and I was never a guy that went to the sheets and all this shit. But right. during this whole time, New Jack, rest his soul, was cutting these promo. I found out about this later when I discovered YouTube. <laughs> this whole time, you guys, you and Bubba were, were killing it in New York. New Jack was cutting these, I have to say, awesome fucking promos now that I go back and watch it. But he was shooting on you guys. Was there legitimate heat between you guys for years? Yeah, yeah, it all had to do with me and a certain female. Oh, here we go. (laughs) It was a female that he used to date. Okay. And, you know, Jack, you know, didn't treat this person very nicely. And I remember I actually liked her. 
Right. And, you know, Jack had a reputation of being with a lot of women. Okay. So when this was like a year or two after, you know, him and her broke up and, you know, he's bad mouthing and everything. And I said, all right, well, I'm going to swoop right in. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I did. And we right. started dating and then he started cutting these hellacious promos on me. You know, right. fuck Devon, you know, he, he, he's, you know, he's tasting me now. You know, how's it taste, Devon? And I just went, all right. I've, and then I, I guess I could just, I pulled the trigger when I said something like, um, remember that girl you thought I was doing? It really wasn't her. It was the other girl that you had that you told me to keep company. That's the one I was fucking. And what happened was I said that to a mark. We were down, we were at a carousel at an airport waiting for our bags. And the guy told me, New Jack just cut this promo on you and blah, blah, blah. You want to hear it? I said, yeah, sure. So I heard it. And that's when I cut that promo on him. I said, you give this to New Jack. Wow. You tell him I was fucking her and wasn't the person who you thought was with her. And that set it off. That set it off. That set it off. And next thing you know, he started berating me and going off on me. So it all started with a girl. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, we did the song We Had Enough for WWE. And he was saying some shit about me that I was like, okay, you want to cut promos? All right. So when, um, what was the guy that did um, WWE's music? Jim Johnston? Jim Johnson, when he called me and Bubba in to do the song We Had Enough, I said, like, oh, cool. You know, the rap song, like a Run DMC version, Me to Arrow Smith type. I was like, all right, cool. And so I asked him, I said, you mind if I cut a promo in there? And he was like, what do you mean a promo? Is it a rap? I was like, yeah, I can do a rap. So New Jack loved Tupac. Right. And I like Biggie. So I okay. took a line from Tupac when I said, all these other wrestlers want to be like me. Uh, wait, I said, all these other wrestlers want to be like me. Now, now you're looking like New Jack, flabby and sick, trying to play a hate on my shit. We had enough. And he heard that and went off. <laughs> <laughs> he went off. And he got with the, with the guy Bootsy Collins because he was good friends with Bootsy Collins. And uh, they went in the studio and they did a version uh, coming back at me. And it never really got over. Oh. But because, um, you know, again, WWE had the form to push We Had Enough out there. Right. And, you know, at that time, Bootsy was huge, you know, but he it, it didn't go anywhere. So not everybody heard New Jack's song. And then from there, it it was just escalating big, one after the other. Right. One, one thing, other, and you have to give him credit. That guy could talk. God oh, did. he made you. He made you believe everything he said. Well, he made you believe it. And the great thing, and the great thing about it is, and I have to say this, that you know, Jack and I had buried it, buried the beef, and we hugged each other, and yeah. we did all of that, and um, we we were talking on the phone quite regular. Oh, and, uh, you know, and then I remember the last time I saw Jack was at an independent show. And because uh, we had talked after this, but the last time I physically saw him was at an independent show. And Bubba politicked us to go on first. <laughs> so we would have to stay for the whole show. And uh, we went on first. And then New Jack, I think, was last. And um, I looked at him. I said, Jack, I'm cutting out of here. And he was like, all right, Devon. He's like, you take care of yourself. I was like, hey, man, I love you, man. And I hugged him. And I was like, I was like, let's talk soon. And right. he was like, you got it. And that was it. That was the last time I physically saw him. But so when I heard he passed, I was very happy to say that the last words I uttered to him in person was that I love you, bro. Yeah. And, you know, that was it. And then I remember us talking on the phone. And I said the same thing to him. You know, I said, I love you, man. I was like, I'll talk to you later. Because we would just call each other out of the blue, you know, after all of that beef went on. Yeah. And we were laughing. We were basically laughing. We were just like, all these fans, all these marks are biting into what we're doing. Could you imagine if I was really in a company that you were in and we were going at each other like that? The fans would eat that shit up. And that was the one thing we had said to each other after we made up. We were like, we should have been, I, we should have been in the same company together. Because yeah. that would have made a lot of money because these marks would have thought that we were really shooting yeah. on each other at that point. And at that point, it. verbally we were, but physically we weren't. Wow. Fuck. So uh, 
Well, before we get to these super chats, because you're a popular guy, Devon. Holy Christ. Uh, James, do you have anything for our guest? Uh, yeah, a quick one. So we had uh, Sean Oliver on recently, and he's promoting Todd Gordon's book. So I have to ask about the ECW Travelodge. <laughs> Any stories? I'm sure you've got a few. Listen, if you so, can't stand publicly, just it's okay, dude. <laughs> well, that's where the New Jack story started. Oh, right. <laughs> it was it was at the travel lodge. Uh, the one girl that you know, he said, "Be on." He was like, you know, I got met this cop and this and that and blah blah blah. You know, I'm gonna go hang out with her. I want you to keep this girl company for me. I was like, uh, okay. And this girl. <laughs> Look, this girl was fine as hell. And I mean, to this day, I was like, damn, what was her name? I'm like, where is she? <laughs> I mean, she was like flawless, man. Her body was, oh God, it was great. And that's where that's where it all began because I wanted that, that was the girl I, I mentioned to him in, that, in the text message that I was messing with uh, at the time. And uh, I don't know, I guess Jack didn't think that that was really gonna happen, but it did. <laughs> um, <laughs> it did and um you know that's where it all stemmed from but god there was so many um memories coming out of the travel lodge so many groupie stories <laughs> yeah. so many um stuff that you would only see with the boys right. uh that you would only you would, you would think that you would only see, you ever, let me put it this way you ever see the movie boogie nights yes there you go. That's the travel. There you go. There you go. <laughs> that's Man. the best way. That's the best way I can come up with it. I mean, because we would just, oh my God, listen, it was like Sodom and Gomorrah. It was, it was, it was, it was literally drug, sex, and rock and roll at the travel lodge. Uh, how many years did that last? Well, I folded in 2001, but I mean, like peak ECW was what, what, 97, 98? 98 was peak. Um, but remember, the travel lodge was going on before I got there in 96. So I'm going to probably say probably from 94 wow. to about 97, 98. That's how much the botany was going on in that place. But for as long as it was. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get to some of these questions. I'll, I'll be right back. I got a bladder issue. I'll be right back, buddy. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, he drinks about eight liters of water a day. Uh, <laughs> Right, one boss came in. Thank you. Hi, Devon. How was it working under Hogan and Bischoff and TNA? Did they really think they could beat WWE in the ratings? Did you enjoy working the Nasty Boys? Um, I think in their heart they thought that we could beat WWE, but I think they failed to understand that Vince was going to pull out every dirty trick there was uh, when we went head to head with them uh, that one time and. Vince did. He brought back Austin. He brought back every hard-hitting person he possibly could to go up against us. And we didn't have the talent in TNA at the time to compete with that. So we got destroyed. Um, I actually liked working with Hogan and Bischoff because TNA's management was not giving me a fair shot when Bubba and I uh, separated and went our separate ways. They were not. It was Hogan and Bischoff and actually saw me working and busting my ass, uh, you know, to become that singles guy. And I had left the company at the time, and Bischoff came up with the idea of bringing me into Aces and Eights, and it was it was great from there. How much did you enjoy working that storyline? Because that was one of the highlights of the Hogan and the Bischoff era, in my opinion. We, I loved it. I mean, I think everybody that was a part of that whole sequence, um, we all loved it. We thought Bischoff had outdone himself with the NWO, but here it is. He comes along and he does the aces and eights. That was his baby. Don't let anybody fool you. He came up with that idea. He wrote it. He had the master plan behind it. That was all Bischoff. Yeah, awesome. Uh, great question. There's a question I, I was thinking of as well. Uh, Thank you, David. Devon, what was your reaction to seeing Edge doing the spear on Jeff Hardy when he was grabbing the titles at Mania 17? Well, my thing was I was glad it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> I basically had the unfortunate uh, task to hang with Jeff Hardy, which I always tell Jeff I will never do it again. Um, <laughs> that man beat me before the ladder was moved, and I'm screaming at him, if you ever loved me, you would stop kicking me the ladder is not moved 
and Edge is screaming up top. He goes, what's going on? I go, move the goddamn ladder. I said, he's trying to kill me. Move the ladder. <laughs> <laughs> it was like Apollo's trainer when he told Rocky, throw the damn towel, man. Just throw the towel. But that was me when, um, you know, when Jeff was kicking me and I'm screaming at Edge, move the goddamn ladder now. He's trying to kill me. Um, you know, I was just happy at that point because it was like, I think we did, that was SummerSlam. And then we did WrestleMania. I think it was like eight months later, we did WrestleMania. Yeah. So I was just happy that I wasn't hanging with Jeff no more. And I think how many years later we saw, I wind up doing it with Christian. And I was like, okay, I'll hang with Christian. He's safe. <laughs> yeah. uh, Joe Wrestling. Uh, Devon, what was your experience working with Batista? How did that come about, the uh, Deacon Batista? Thing. Well, it was Vince's idea. I, I think it was Vince. It was either Vince or Brother Love. He basically, I came into work one day and they said, hey, we're putting this guy named Dave Batista with you. And I went, oh, okay, you know, cool. And I was like, I, he, I literally, it literally felt like my bodyguard. I mean, I felt like the little, you know, I had never felt so small before in my life mm -hmm. until Batista came next to me. And I was like, oh my God, like everywhere we went, it was like, you know, the people would part like the Red Sea, you know, when they would see him because he was like so massive. Yeah. And I felt like untouchable. I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was walking around chess all out. I was like, yeah, yeah. You know, but no, it was great working with Dave. I had a good time and, um, you know, I'm very happy for all his success. And, you know, I tried to help Dave as much as possible. I always said when he was with me, it was like being in elementary school junior high and half a high school when he got with rick flair triple h it was kind of like going the rest of the high school into college you know he got his degree and you know i was very proud and happy of his success and what he had accomplished um you know i was very proud of him and i told him that i remember the wrestlemania 16 uh when he came back and did um I think the match with Triple H um, yeah. in 2016 uh, that WrestleMania in Texas. I remember right before he went out, I went to him and told him, I said, I'm very proud of you, man. I was like, you go out there and you knock it out the box. I know you haven't been in the ring in years, but I just want you to know I love you, my brother, and thank you for everything that you and I had accomplished when you were my deacon. And now you're, 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 you're just a, a major superstar in your own right. I yeah. said, congratulations, my brother. I said, keep up the great work. Now you go out there and kick Triple H's ass. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me, he said, we'll do, Rev. We'll do. Because he never called me Devon. He would always call me Rev. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. he never called me Devon. It was always Rev. Reverend or Rev? Uh, cool. <laughs> uh, Vitamin Vision, thank you. Testify, uh, I think you've answered this already. Uh, did you grow up religious? You had the preacher gimmick with Batista. How did you come up with Testify? Uh, again, yeah, it goes all goes back to ECW with uh, Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, and it was actually Paul Heyman that came up um, with saying Testify after everything I did. And it just, it just rolled from there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, Dr. Frankenstein is what we like to call Paul Heyman. You know, he created all of us. And... Uh, you know, when no one else gave us a chance, we were the misfits that Paul Heyman took in and gave us a chance. And we were very happy and proud of that. So I owe Paul my life. You know, I will always, you know, be grateful to him for what he did for me because nobody was looking at me at the time to come in and work for their organization. But Paul took me in and did it. Was there a lot of work? Was there a lot of work back then, though? What do you mean? We're talking about like 93, 94, 95. Was like, how was the independence in like uh, Northeast back then? It was hot. It was good. It was very, very good. Um, there were a lot of indie shows that okay. were being done uh, during that time. And remember, this was when the companies started folding, like just about started to fold. It wasn't there yet, but they were starting in 1991. Because uh, remember, there were territories everywhere you went. And um, so these, a lot of these territories were still open. Japan was very, very hot at the time, um, you know, and just wrestling up north was hot at right. the time. Right. Uh, 
with a group from the Savaldis. Uh, they were hot, um, you know, and, you know, even the local promotion that Johnny Raj was working with, I think it was called NCW. Okay. Uh, they were hot at the time. And, you know, there was a lot of things that were going on during that time and period. Nice. So you'd probably get about three or four matches a week if you were lucky? If you were lucky. Yeah, cool. but that's a lot, especially nowadays. That's a lot. No. Yeah. no. Um, I didn't know you were from Brooklyn. Shout out from Fort Green. What neighborhood did you grow up and what schools did you attend? Uh, no string in Myrtle. I grew up, I was born in 56 Summit of Projects. Um, I, I lived in the 56 Summit of Projects uh, uh, building. Um, and uh, again, I was, I'm sorry, I was born in Brooklyn Hospital. And I grew up in 56 Summit of Projects. And um, I went to kindergarten there. Then we left there and went to Coney Island. And I went to PS 288 uh, Elementary School. Uh, and then when drugs came on the scene in 83 and crack went through the projects like wildfire, uh, making people that went to work, you know, ordinary people that went to work and busted their behinds and they took that one hit on the crack, it was like they were done and they turned into instant junkies. It was the crack pandemic had rushed through the projects worse than AIDS ran through the gay community during that time in the 80s. That's how big crack was. And, you know, for those that were born during that time, you know, can relate to what I just said and how I compared it because AIDS during that time had ran through the, the gay community like crazy. And it was the same thing in terms of uh, crack cocaine growing up in the projects where I was uh in 78 79 uh going into 89 um and my mother and grandmother said you know what we got to get him out of here because if not he might fall victim so right. they they brought me to long island um huntington long island uh to live with my aunt uh and i went to school out there so monday through friday i would go to school in Long Island, I'd finished junior high and half of high school. And then I um, I would go back Friday, Saturday, and Sunday back to Brooklyn. And then on Sunday night, I would leave and go back to Long Island and go to school because my parents just did not want me living in, in the projects at that time because uh, it was so bad. Wow. Um, you know, and so they got me out of there and they saved my life, really. Wow. Man, there's, I could go on for another hour just on that, about like <laughs> conspiracies about crack cocaine and the, the government and shit, but let's just talk about <laughs> some... uh, Dave, on now that your sons are wrestling, will you start a new Dudley's stable? You could get two of your nephews to join like a Japanese Dudley and a Middle Eastern <laughs> Dudley or even an Eskimo <laughs> Dudley. <laughs> Listen, if WWE or AEW or even Impact want to do that, I'm all for it. Just as long as I don't have to wrestle as much. <laughs> all hey, all so I want to do is six men. Point. How was your sons? I remember them. Fuck, they were just kids, man. They used to come to the shows. How are they yeah, doing? Renee, Renee, I'm going to let you know right now, they make us look like Rey Mysterio. That's how big they are right now. Oh, shit. <laughs> They're big boys now, man. Wow. And we were doing independent shows. Let me just say, we were doing independent shows together. And we were doing the whole Devon get the table. And I told him, I said, do not call me dad, call me Devon. You know, because they they made a mistake one time. They said, Dad, I said, God damn it, say Devon. Oh, sorry, Devon. <laughs> you know, <laughs> get the table. So the one night I said, do me a favor, please don't say dad, say Devon. It's okay. I was like, and we'll do the Devon get the table spot. Well, they did it and he pushed me. Man, he pushed me so hard. I looked at him, I said, you know I'm gonna whoop your ass when we get back to the locker room. Man. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I didn't even hit you hard. I said, you know I'm old. Stop. <laughs> this ain't 1991, Devon. This is 2023, Devon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Renee might have froze. Um CMZO, thank you. Devon, welcome. How was your experience back in Impact for the 3D reunion? Love your boys' work against <laughs> What's on it? 
Um, it was great. Um, I had a really good time. The locker room welcomed me with open arms. It did feel weird because new generation of, you know, of kids now and, you know, I'm the old man, I'm the vet and, you know, I'm not the young kid anymore. And walking into that locker room, I didn't know what to expect because, you know, you hear so much about how the young guys don't show any respect to the veterans anymore. But the people in Impact showed me so much respect, so much love. I had a great time working with them. And, you know, we designed the match um, to where, because I had been gone for seven years. I hadn't taken a bump or nothing wow. in, seven, in seven years. And, you know, I was nervous. The first time I had been nervous to work in a wrestling ring in a long time. So I was nervous. But, you know, we did it. We designed it. And we made it work. Nice. Nice. Uh, just quickly want to say over 400 people in the chat, thank you for tuning in, everyone. If you could uh, hit the like button and subscribe, that will help us. So thank you. Uh, Laser, hey, Devon, was at SummerSlam 15 when you and Bubba came back and attacked a new day. I popped so hard, my sister thought I had a heart attack. I'm from <laughs> uh, Brooklyn. I'm the same age as your boys, TNT. Any advice you've got for me as someone who is starting out? Well, find a reputable wrestling school, uh, someone that has been somewhere where you're trying to get to. Because a lot of these guys, they open up schools that never been anywhere, never been on Monday Night Raw, never been on SmackDown, never been on a WWE pay-per-view, or never main event anything. But yet they're going to tell you how to do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. If they couldn't get themselves on there, how are they going to get you there? Paul on into the same thing. Sure. Yeah, how, are gonna get, how, how are they going to get you there? Yeah. Think about it. They can yeah. they can feed you all the BS you want. Like I told one student of mine that said something about a guy who opened up a school and thought that I was going to be mad about it. I said, let me ask you a question. Was he ever on SmackDown? No. Exactly. Was he ever on Raw? Nope. Did he help steal the show at WrestleMania two years in a row? No. Is he in the Hall of Fame? No. <laughs> I said, so just that alone, why am I nervous? Right. Why am I scared? Right. Let him open up all the dojos he wants. I don't give a damn. Yeah. You know, and that's not knocking those people. They, they, they want to make money doing that. Let them do that. That's fine. But don't think I'm going to put fear. It's going to put fear in my heart because you moved down the block or what have you. I built up a reputation at my wrestling school uh and pumped out a lot of a lot of students both in wwe aew impact and new japan you know so i'm not worried at all and that's what i tell people go somewhere where it's repable where somebody who's been somewhere not someone who's never been but yet can tell you you know point in case move to florida come to dda i got a big special going on <laughs> I got well, to we're gonna, we're gonna plug your stuff. Don't worry about that, buddy. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, David, thank you. Hey, Devon, just want to say yourself, Bubba, the Hardys, Nedge, and Christian made the tag team division amazing. You guys had chemistry. Yeah, that was the one thing that, you know, we were very proud of because we would have never thought that we would have had chemistry like that, you know? Um six guys that really never touched before um touched and then made magic mm. um that was just something that will probably never be duplicated or done again i've tried to say numerous times like the new day and the usos was the new dudleys and hardys and of course i got a lot of um not hate but i got a lot of no Devon, they ain't gonna be you guys no you guys are special Yes, and I get that. We were special, but you got to give the new generation credit. And right now, I think the Usos are doing phenomenal. And to answer the question, I'm sure probably will come up. Yes, the Usos did ask permission to use the 3D. And they call it the one and up or 1D or whatever they call it. But we were very honored that a generation that had came after us wanted to use a move that we created back when they were in elementary school and now they're going on national tv on a major company and using that finish you know i was very happy very proud hell i had back surgery laying in bed recuperating watching the pay-per-view 
saw them hit 3D and I jumped up. I went, oh shit, my back. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh God. You know, I was very happy, very proud. So no, Bubba and I weren't upset. You know, we were very happy that they did it. And, um, you know, again, my hat goes off to those guys. I wish we would have wrestled the Usos now as opposed to the Usos when we came back the second run because the Usos now are so much more experienced. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know? Uh, any memories working with Take in the main event of the Great American Bash? Oh, that's where they killed Paul Bearer. Yeah, um, I do know Take kept shaking his head with the whole crip thing. <laughs> I don't take it in like that at all. Um, um, he didn't like that at all. He was uh, very iffy about that, which he had every right to be, mm -hmm. uh, because I, 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 if I can remember something acts because we were doing, we filmed it beforehand. Yes. So the only people that knew, you were there, right, Renee? Yep. Yeah, so we filmed it before the people got in there. So. Yep. It was weird because the people's reaction to what they were seeing on the screen was totally different. And they were kind of confused, like what the hell is going on? Yeah. The level that they're seeing, the concrete coming up to Paul Barra wasn't the same level that was in the arena. And they kept shooting back and forth from the arena shot to the video that we cut prior to the people coming into the building. It was, it was crazy, man, it was crazy. <laughs> Uh, hey, Devon, I met you at Hamilton Comic Con two years ago, and I just want to say thanks uh, for being a real one. It was by far the most pleasant uh, meet and greet experience I've had. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I, I, I like it when fans, you know, express, you know, how much of a nice person <laughs> that I am, you know, after meeting me. Um, I can admit you know. to that. <laughs> very good person. Uh, thank you for all of that. I really, really appreciate it. You want to get some, Renee? Great to see you, Devon. Huge fan of early ECW Dudley's. Bubba cut rated. Right yes, he did. On audience members sometimes. Hilarious stuff. You ever fight to keep a straight face at the things he'd say? Man, your partner in ECW would cut these promos. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, it wasn't him that got me. It was more, it was more Joel Gertner. Oh, <laughs> Joel Gertner was great, man. Yeah, oh, man. God. We had him on here, too. We had him on here, man. Fuck. Uh, he yeah. was witty. He knew his stuff and the things that he would say. Big Dick Dudley, God rest his soul, who was also trained by Johnny Rods. I forgot to add that in there. He would have his hair over his face because he would laugh so hard. He didn't want people to see him laughing. <laughs> Gertner was a champ, man. Oh, God, I miss him. You know, well, well, well. <laughs> you know, uh, he 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 did the thing on Sonny Bono when Sonny Bono passed away. Oh God, he cut a promo about him being a skiing accident. Oh, it was I, it was brutal, but yet it was funny. He had everybody in that arena just dying. Yeah. It was he was one of a kind, Joel Gertner, man. Very talented, Devon. You were my childhood. <laughs> Listen, you son of a bitch. <laughs> you know, what's your brother? Live, very close to New Road. Did you attend any events at the Winchester County Center growing up? My dad met Andre back in the 70s. Also, can you tell me about ECW Heat Wave 99? No, I never never did any shows um, at the Westchester County Center. I didn't go there until I got in WWE. Um, that was the only time I had went there. Um, Heat Wave 99, did not know it was going to be so memorable uh, that the fans still talk about 30 years later. Um, you know, Bubba was in rare form that night and had no idea that he was going to say the things he was going to say. We didn't know any of the things that Bubba was going to say half the time. You know, um, I do remember as he was saying it, I was like, oh, this is going too far. This is going way too far. We shouldn't be saying this. Uh, <laughs> we did anyway. So uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, done. What's done? Any memories of working with Elijah Burke, the Pope, in TNA? Did you get along with Elijah? Yeah, I got along great with Elijah. We did a program together. He was great, but he was stiff as hell. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> that son of a bitch slapped me one time because my twins, they did it. We did a storyline where he got in my boy's head and my boys turned on me. Oh. And left and went with the Pope. And then I got him back at the end of the story. But the twins were holding me one time and he had this thing where he put this glove on and put powder. And then he would like bitch slap you. Boom, boom, boom. I didn't think anything of it. He hit me that one time. I said, I'm going to whoop your ass, Pope. <laughs> I said, oh, I said, you're going to pay for that one. And then he hit me again, and he's laughing. I said, and I went in the back. I said, you know I'm going to fuck you up, right? You know I'm going to fuck you up when we get in the ring. I'm just letting you know. He was like, and then he, you know, he did that whole Pope thing. Devon, what? I was like, don't play that bullshit with me. You know what the hell you were doing. You slapped the shit out of me. <laughs> you were part of the match where the mass transit incident occurred. What was, yeah. What was going through your head when that was going on, bud? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. I mean, there was nothing. I mean, I, you know, what happened, you know, was a tragedy and what New Jack did um, that night. Um, you know, I didn't know. It was, he went way too far. Yeah. Um, you know, we didn't know that the kid was 17 years old. Uh, he lied about his age and said he was eight, he was over eighteen. I think he was either eighteen or over eighteen. Yeah. Back then, they didn't ask for proof, you know, um, and we ultimately paid for it. But it was one of those things where it was something that should not have happened, and unfortunately, I was part of it. Any memories of the Aces Nate storyline? Absolutely. Getting drunk every time we did those promos because it was real beer. <laughs> we would mess up the promos on purpose just so that we can get the beer back again. It was great. Great time. Who was the best drinker out of you? I'm sorry? Sorry, who was uh, the best drinker out of all of you? Uh, I'm going to say probably Mike Knox and Doc. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mike Knox and Doc, especially Mike Knox. I mean, he can put it away, boy. <laughs> Mike. Uh, and the great thing about it is Aces and Aids, we actually felt like we were a real club. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That was, it was really, really good time. I missed that a lot. Uh, before ECW had their national TV deal, my older brother and I would watch you on the internet through a dial-up modem on the, wow, the tiniest resolution screen. I was also the only kid with an ECW shirt in town. Yeah, it it, it was uh, kind of niche there for quite a few years, right? Yes. Because of, of I mean, the, the availability. Because, I mean, we only got it up here in Canada, like late 99, 2000. You know, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it was totally different. We weren't on a big scale like that. So anything that we did, you know, it was kind of like you had, it was like videotape swapping and things like that. There was no internet back then to even stream or anything. Right. So very different times. Uh, what is your wildest ECW story? I'm sure you have all kinds. Um, yeah, I, do. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I can say it on tape. <laughs> oh, okay. If you can't say it, that's okay, buddy. You can just imagine that. Uh, we've already uh, spoke about New Jack, so we'll uh, bypass this one. Uh, I'm sorry, not this one. Uh, let's see. Ross. Here we go. Diva, yes. much respect, man. When you left ECW, how long you, uh, how long do you think it was going to last? Was it surprising? It was been less than two years after you guys left. Were you guys were you guys victim of the no pay, the bounce checks? No, we we got our money. All he paid us, we were never shorted or anything like that. So we were good. We walked out of there given everything that we were supposed to get. Well, that's good. That's good. Uh, did you see New Jack before? Uh, we just talked about that. You guys mm -hmm. left. In all your travel, what's your favorite food city? Yeah, which one did you like the most? Australia. Yeah? Loved Australia's food. Australia. Loved it. It was great. Personally, I'm, I'm a Japanese guy. Devon, you'd be shocked how gentrified Flatbush and No Strand is today. That whole Flatbush era ain't the same. Brooklyn is a damn near gentrified. When's the last time you've been back home? 
Oh man, it's been a while. Uh, the last time I was back home was probably maybe about four or five years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. But I kind of like just drove in and drove out because we were at the Barclays Center. Oh, okay. Yeah, your um, mother and father are still alive, or no? My mom's still alive, but my dad passed away in two thousand three. Okay, sorry, buddy. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. Thank you. Devon in 99, did the WF guys look down on you? Yeah, how was it when you first got to New York? Was it, you know? Well, we got we got, we got got put right to the wolves. We got put to the John and uh, right. Mantro right away. Right. And that showed you right there. We were going to earn our respect, and that's exactly what we did. Yeah. We earned it. <laughs> we earned it with Ron and John. I mean, we fought. We, 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 you know, we were in that ring. We were going at it, and they gave it to us and we gave it right back to them. You know, I'm surprised that we're still living, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this last one right here before uh, we bid you adieu. Yeah, this one up. Yeah. Memories of the Dudleys and La Resistance in 03. 03. Um, I do oh, remember one of the things I remember when, who was the guy that was with you guys? Um, Conway, Rob. Okay. Conway, when he took Spike and threw him outside the ring through the table and he missed the table completely. Oh, that was me and Sly. Oh, wait, that, that wasn't him? No, no, you guys, the, the next week, the next, like, we did that to Spike. Right. The next week, you guys did the thing with Rob, and you guys put two tables, but his head, like, his head hit the second table, and he took the same bump as Spike did. Remember that? Okay, I thought, I thought the, yeah, I thought that was him. No, 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 no. It was me and it was me and Sly. Oh wow! <laughs> I did not know that. I do remember though. One time we were coming out, and I had no idea because you had got up to Gorilla late, a little late. When the music hit. You were coming in. You had to put your robe on and everything. And this is when they gave you the dog, Fifi. Oh, okay. And me and Bubba were in the ring, and then next thing you know, your music hit, your music hit, and Sly comes out first, and then you came out with the dog. I said, what the hell? I said, who oh. gave him a dog? <laughs> I remember one time we were at a house show, and it was, I think it was me and Sly. And you, anyway, Bubba's, like, talking. I, I was chewing gum. I spit gum, and it went right into Bubba's mouth. Oh <laughs> yeah, he was like yelling whatever, jaw jacking before the match, and I just went, <laughs> and my gum went right through his mouth. I was like, oh. was we can actually, we can actually say he tasted Rene Dupree now. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, man, obviously uh, we, uh, you know, you've been part of some of the biggest, biggest matches of my career with with you and your partner, and uh, you. you know. And you were always a professional and always so kind and always so nice to me. And uh, I just want to thank you for all those. And when I hugged you this last time there, I couldn't stop hugging you. I didn't know what came oh, over you. It was, <laughs> it was so good to see you again. You know what I mean? You don't realize you. what someone means to you until you go away and then you come back. It was so good to see you again, man. Uh, thank so you. Same here. Yeah. You know, yeah. one of the memories I also like to tell my kids sometimes when we did that show, The Mullets, and yes, they were they were filming, and you and I were doing spots in the ring for the TV cameras. It was great. I yeah. went and did a leapfrog and didn't jump up all the way and almost broke my neck. And he was <laughs> like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! You okay? Stop, 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 stop! Cut, cut!" <laughs> yeah, that was. I had heard. I had heard that that show had got canceled after our episode. Is that true? Yes, they didn't get the ratings that they thought they were going to get because they had all big, big hitters, Lonnie Anderson, Burt Reynolds' his wife, yeah. and all of that. And yeah. the guy who played on Seinfeld as uh, Leanne the Boyd. Boss. <laughs> yeah, they were both on there. And yeah. I just remember uh, the ratings, they didn't expect, UPN just dropped it. They dropped it quick. Wow. Yeah, it was like, it was like, no, it was like two episodes and they dropped it. They dropped it, okay. Yeah. yeah. I remember Lonnie Anderson, man, she was old, but she was hot. Yeah, she was. And she kept hugging and grabbing. And I was just like, okay, um, why don't you marry the Burt Reynolds? You don't want me. <laughs> and I remember Elaine's boss, man. He wasn't friendly at all. He was no, not. he was very, he was very standoffish. Standoffish, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, shit, man, Demon, it was great to let's let's plug your stuff, man. I know you got a badass school in Florida, so let's promote that. Yeah, it's uh Devon Dudley Academy. We call it DDA. 
It's in Winter Park, Florida. It's three minutes away from the Performance Center. Okay. Uh, I, we're open Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. We have two separate classes. The beginner's class is from 3 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. The advanced class is from 5.30 to 10 p.m. Our normal rate is $3,500 for the year, $500 down, $250 a month if you can't pay the $35 all up front. But we have a special going on right now. If you do it before January 9th, it'll be a thousand down paid in full for one year. Wow. And, if, and if you do it after the ninth, then it'll be 1500 down for the year and until July, until January 31st. So we have that, we have those specials going on and, uh, you know, we've already got people taking advantage of it and uh, coming in again, you got one full year, you know, at either a thousand or fifteen hundred, as opposed to thirty five hundred for the year. Wow! And so, do you uh, are you hands on with all the training and stuff? I am hands on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. I'm there. Wow! Well, I can attest. Yeah. And I've been in the ring with Devon, and he knows his stuff. You know? <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Uh, one thing I know is, whenever you go to one of these major companies, the first thing they ask you is, "Who trained you?" You know, yeah. so you yeah. the Hall of Famer that. Okay, well, let's 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 take a look. Let's see what you can do, right? So, Absolutely. Uh, yep. So, oh, and if you and if you want, you can go to my Instagram, which is DDA, uh, Devon Dudley Academy on Instagram. Also, testify Devon uh, on Instagram as well. Also on Twitter, testify Devon, as well as Facebook, testify Devon. Awesome. There you go, folks. If you're looking to get into the wrestling business, right now is your chance for only a thousand dollars down. Jesus, take advantage. Of it. <laughs> take All advantage. Right. Take advantage, Devon. Thank you again for everything, and uh, I hope I uh, hope I get to see you again real soon, my friend. I'm sure we will, my friend. Thank you so much, guys. I had I had a blast, and to all the fans, again, thank you for your support and love, and hopefully, I'll see each and every one of you soon. Thank you, guys. All right. Good night, right. bud. Good night. Good night.